today I'm going to continue a little bit um, with what Nacho left off with last time, virus structure, and then we'll move on into virus classification and then potentially get a little bit to virus entry. So to start out with the assembly part that Nacho didn't get to. Um, I love his little shaking thing where it self-assembles. Um, I think that's really an amazing visual tool for thinking about how virions can actually come together. I think it was only about Mark IV by the time we got one that actually worked. Uh, <clears throat> so this is basically the description on how that goes about happening. There are really multiple different ways that you can get assembly of viruses, or I should say assembly of virions, because of course viruses are the whole life cycle. Correct me every time I miss that the rest of the term. So <clears throat> basically what Nacho was showing was this nucleic acid assisted assembly. So you have your capsid protein, and then that comes together with the nucleic acid. That was the Velcro on the inside of each of his individual capsid subunits. And then all of those come together to give you a mature virion. That's only one of the ways that you can get virion assembly to take place. The easiest way, um, quote unquote, is actually to have a self-assembly process where you just need the capsid protein. And I don't know if he had a chance. I think he didn't actually talk about this. It's actually what he's trying to do in part of his research, is to take the, just the capsid protein by itself. And that capsid protein can actually form into one of these often you know, subunits, and that will come together. And you end up with an empty capsid that has no genome associated with it whatsoever. And then the nucleic acid gets packaged inside of this capsid um, to give you a final virion, a final infectious virion here. Um, this is the simplest. Turns out this only happens really probably for the simplest of viruses, um, those with one capsid protein, and often you know, T equals one, maybe a T equals three icosahedral symmetry. Some of the more complicated ones almost always are going to use these things called scaffolding proteins. And the whole idea of a scaffolding protein is a protein that's required for assembly, but is not present in the final virion. And you know, scaffolding protein works actually a lot like you would think of scaffold in terms of building a building. So you put a scaffold together, build the building, take the scaffold down. Uh, and that's exactly how it works with these kinds of virions. In many cases, the nucleic acid will actually displace the scaffolding protein. And, and we'll take, take a look at um, examples of all of these um, as we move on through the rest of the course. Um, again, this is um, Nacho's video in terms of putting everything together. Um, I think his record time is like about 30 seconds for shaking to get the whole thing to assemble. Um, <clears throat> um, here we are, you know, trying to get all of that to go. <clears throat> of course, once you've assembled, um, this is great and wonderful, and the virion itself then is nice and stable, except when it gets to the host, when its genome needs to be released. And so this is what Nacho talked about last time which was the whole idea of metastability. So virions are metastable. They're going to be really stable when they're external to cells. But as soon as they find the appropriate host, then they want to be unstable because the genome needs to be released. And there are lots of different ways that that can happen. Um, probably the most famous of these, and we'll probably take a look at it later today or on Wednesday, is for these bacteriophages, particularly bacteriophage T4, that literally has a structural change which pokes a hole in the exterior, in the case of bacteriophage T4, two membranes, the outer and the inner membrane, in order to release its genome on the inside. So it's really kind of like a syringe process, um, which is amazing if you think about it. It's happening at sort of a nanometer kind of scale that these syringes happen. But we'll, we'll take a look at that <clears throat> a little bit later on. But it's probably because it's actually really hard to get through the outside of a bacterium. And that makes perfect sense from the bacterium's point of view because bacteria, they can be in biofilms, but often they'll be floating around by themselves. So they've got to have a pretty tough exterior. And so getting a viral genome through that is really quite a challenge. And 
we'll see again for the various different viruses how this happens. Uh, one thing about this is that often it's actually a high pressure of DNA that allows the DNA to come out of the capsid when there's actually a hole to let it out. Another kind of cell that we'll talk about are the plant cells. They have exactly the same kinds of problems, a really tough exterior, particularly the at least exterior parts of the plant that the virus is going to be encountering. Turns out that those are actually even too hard to get through without some help. And as we'll see when we talk about plant viruses in a couple of weeks, most of that help actually comes from some kind of herbivorous, often insect, which will then be cutting through the walls of the plant cell, cell wall, and then allowing the virus to get in. But then, once it's in, that's actually going to be in a very similar kind of state to where we have the virus on, say, the virion on the outside of the cell. So that's to be some kind of change that happens. And that's the one that I, in fact, is in my introductory slide, one of these plant viruses undergoes a pretty major conformational change in order to get that genome out. And you could also think of the syringe action that happens on some of these bacterial viruses as a similar kind of conformational change. And so we'll a lot about conformational changes um, as we move on through the rest of the course. We also mentioned that you have naked viruses and enveloped viruses. Envelope viruses have membranes around them, or I should say at least a lipid bilayer around them. That is always picked up from some part of the cell. And the process how that is being picked up is something called budding. And budding is where you have the virion, that then picks up the membrane and puts its genome, which is represented by the purple pieces here on the inside, inside of the virion. One thing that's, however, very specific about the virion and the virus envelope is these virus envelopes have virus envelope proteins, um, almost always glycoproteins. What we mean by glycoproteins, they have sugars attached to them, and so that's these little purple Y structures here. Hopefully, is this visible in the back? It's okay, lighting-wise? Okay, good. That's why I like this room so much better than that other one. <laughs> uh, <clears throat> so these gly glycosylation points um, are put on the protein on the outside, probably for a couple of different reasons. Um, one of them is to protect those virions from cellular defense mechanisms, but also probably to help with solubility to some extent of each of those particles. They don't all end up aggregating with each other. And when we talked about hemagglutination two lectures ago, uh, the ability for virions to bind red blood cells together, it turns out that it's these glycosylation points here that really help to bind those red blood cells together. Um, these envelope glycoproteins usually have just a single transmembrane helix and have a large, what we call an ectodomain, so ecto on the outside, and a relatively small um, endodomain on the inside. And again, usually just one of these pretty hydrophobic um, alpha helices. And these are almost always, not surprisingly, going to be the first thing that interacts with the host. Um, and these are going to be these viral membrane proteins. Um, this budding process is, I have here, it's a viral process. The textbook gets really into the budding being a real viral process. But there are vesicles that are released from cells all the time. And so the fact that you have a membrane covered something that's being released from a cell is really not unusual. The unusual thing is having all these viral proteins that are associated um, with them as well. How does budding take place? Now we'll switch back to the ugly slides because um, Nacho makes much prettier slides than I do. Uh, <clears throat> where you can have multiple different ways that virus budding can take place. One of them is that you literally have a often a proteinaceous capsid, a lot like you would see with a naked virus, which then interacts with viral membrane proteins and that will then be released um, outside of the cell. Here we have our infectious virion. In many cases, true for flu, for HIV, you have what's called a matrix protein, um, this often called the M protein, 
that's between the capsid and the envelope proteins. And so this matrix protein was literally going to interact with those endodomains of our membrane proteins and the capsid um, that's present on the inside. And in some cases, those viral capsids actually are not a nice icosahedral shape, but just some kind of ribonucleoprotein complex. And then, again, this is always happening at the membrane. When I say the membrane, I mean, it actually should be different membranes because you can have assembly that takes place at the plasma membrane, as is basically shown here, where you have release of all of these different uh, virions. But you can also have budding take place at basically any of the other membrane-bound components in a eukaryotic cell. You can have budding that happens at the nuclear membrane. You can have budding that happens at the ER. You can have budding that happens at the Golgi. Any place where you've got cellular membranes that can get the proteins associated with them, you can have virus budding that takes place there. And so we'll look at different examples of all of these later on. The, getting the matrix protein associated with the membrane, it can be a direct protein-protein interaction, as I mentioned, with the endodomain of the transmembrane proteins that are present in the envelope, but it also can be a fatty acid that gets attached covalently to that matrix protein. Um, how, do you want, how do you get a protein associated with a membrane? You put a lipid associated with it, because of course lipids are going to be what's part of the membranes. So that's a way to target all of these things together. So that's how we get virus assembly of the enveloped viruses. Again, the naked viruses, these three different ways that can be happening. OK, we've got these wonderful stable virus particles. Now they find a host. How do they get into the host? Well, we saw the case for the bacteriophage, you know, making a hole, basically, in the membrane of the host. But in many cases, you have these you know, nice, stable particles. They have to get degraded somehow. And the way that they get degraded in the vast majority of cases is proteolysis. And we're going to talk a lot about proteolysis as we move on through the rest of the course. Um, proteolysis turns out to be something that's important for assembly as well as for disassembly. Um, proteolysis is great because you have a protein, and then that gets snipped, and that gives you a unidirectionality because reforming peptide bonds, usually that's going to be the ribosome which is doing that. Um, and the energetics that you get from proteolysis really will give you a almost completely unidirectional reaction. Chemical reactions, of course, they can go back the other way as well. Uh, but <clears throat> what this does is it allows, for instance, a virion, when it's releasing its genome, not to take that genome back out and then um, run away and go and find another host to go back into. So we'll, we'll talk a lot about proteolysis. For polio, uh, which we'll spend quite a while talking about, let's see, which one of my do I have polio here? Um, no, actually, don't think I've got a thick one. Is this one? This one, I think, is polio. Um, <clears throat> this one, um, polio requires proteolysis in terms of getting an infectious particle. Um, and that ends up cleaving the capsid proteins as it's being assembled, interestingly enough, and not when it's being released. Um, influenza, HIV, have these so-called fusion proteins, which do just what they say they would do. They fuse, and literally it's fusing the membrane of the virus with the membrane of the host. These have to have proteolysis before they can be functional. Um, Reovirus is uh, another example, actually, we're not going to talk about it in too much detail. Reoviruses are fascinating viruses. They have virions, they actually have two protein shells around the outside, and they actually depend on the cellular proteolysis mechanisms that normally would break things down in order to be able to release these reoviruses and have them be able to get inside the cell. So we'll now, this is sort of a very general idea of proteolysis. We'll talk more about those details um, a little bit later on. So to <clears throat> review structure to some extent, um, again, what Nacho talked about as well, smaller and simpler is better. Um, and the real take-home message there is nucleic acids are really big and inefficient. Proteins are relatively small. So you want to use lots of copies of your capsid protein in order to make a nice symmetrical structure. One of the things that I think Nacho didn't talk about, and that's one of the really fascinating things I think about viruses and math, is that if you're trying to approximate a sphere, which is the 
largest volume and smallest surface area. How do you do that with repeating relatively flat subunits? Um, you make an icosahedral asymmetric particle. And you know, the, the soccer people have filled this, uh, figured this out as well. Um, one thing that unfortunately was so dark in the lecture hall the other day, um, I actually scribbled some capsids um, protein subunits on here. So the five-fold axis that we have here, um, three-fold axis here with six and five. And so this would be what kind of triangulation number? Got six here, five here. We all studied that and reviewed this all weekend. I don't have my class list yet. By Wednesday, I will. I'll ask you questions directly. So what do we need to do? We get from a five-fold axis to a five-fold axis, right? By a, so pentamer to pentamer via hexamers. So we go one and one. So what does that give us? A t equals three. Exactly. So. Um, I've got lots of different ones up here he didn't mention. We've actually got some t equals 4 up here, as well as um, my favorite one here, you know, t equals 31. So it's just basic geometry um, is why many virions have these icosahedrally symmetric capsid structures. Um, it's a simple way with a small amount of genome to get something that approximates a sphere. So um, yeah. Math is everywhere. Um, can't avoid it. Um, helical symmetry. Um, he also mentioned um, the pitch um, is not completely equivalent to a T number because a T number will tell you um, everything about the structure of a icosahedrally symmetric virion. The pitch just tells you about one turn of the helix. You need to know the length in terms of knowing the actual number. So I think he misspoke there in his lecture about saying the pitch will tell you exactly how many subunits you have. You actually need to know the length as well um, as the pitch to be able to know that. Um, and yeah, we just talked about envelopes and disassembly processes. So do we have any questions about T numbers, et cetera? I brought all of my models here. And um, you know, after class, we'll probably have a couple of minutes. So our our younger students can come and join us, come take a look at some of our um, capsid structures up here as well. Okay, everybody clear on T numbers? Is there a T number on exam? I'll be happy how to figure it out. Yes, no, maybe. Do we need us to go over it again? No, okay. Say we're relatively happy. Okay, so <clears throat> spend most of the rest of today talking about gl virus classification. We started talking about this already in terms of the Baltimore classification. Baltimore classification is really all about how you make messenger RNAs because all virions have some kind of genome in, that is packaged inside of them, be it DNA, DNA or RNA. But all viruses have to use cellular ribosomes. So getting to that RNA is the really critical part and that's how David Baltimore came up with his different classifications. There is a official by international treaty body on the taxonomy of viruses, the International Committee on Taxonomy of Viruses. And I was associated with this for a couple of years, um, basically how you classify various different viruses. I thought this was a horrible way to classify viruses and they've been dragged kicking and screaming into the 21st century. So I think they're actually coming to a pretty good place in terms of the virus taxonomy. I forgot to bring my book with me, but it's about you know, this thick and about that square. Um, and that was a couple of years ago in terms of the, the number of viruses that are there. So the ICTV has a particular classification, but then we also have, again, newer ways of thinking about viruses. The ICTV was actually established I think about 60 years ago, if I remember correctly, um, and mostly was involved in thinking about virus diseases. But we now know that diseases can be caused by all kinds of different viruses, even though it's a similar looking disease. The classic example is hepatitis. There are four different kinds of viruses that can cause hepatitis that are not related to each other in the least. So uh, that was the original naming procedure. Now we're thinking much more about genome sequences because we can sequence all of these genomes. And that gives us a much better idea on how they're related to each other, all of these different viruses. And that's fine, except that many viruses, particularly RNA viruses, undergo very rapid evolution. 
And if they're undergoing very rapid evolution, you're going to have lots and lots of sequence change. And so if you want to think about really deep branching, really ancient virus families, how do you think about how they're related to each other? And I think this is actually, well, amusing is maybe not the right word. But people are starting to come back to using structures to think about how things are related to each other. So one of the fun things about this room, you probably saw some of the uh, old seminar speakers. We didn't like their talks very much hanging from the ceiling. Uh, but <clears throat> it's looking at a morphology and how the morphology of different organisms are similar to each other. So the two examples we have here, if I remember correctly, one's a dolphin and one's a sea lion. They're similar to each other, but certainly not identical. One has you know, very rudimentary rear legs and the other one much more developed. So that kind of idea, these things are related to each other, but in a relatively distant fashion, um, saying nothing about looking at their sequences. And so again, it's sort of come full circle in some of the virus classifications. Now we're looking at structures um, as opposed to looking at sequences. So why is it called the ICTV um, taxonomy? All taxonomy is is naming. Why do we care about taxonomy? Um, because we love to classify things, but it also, if we can find those common themes, as I mentioned in lecture one, you know, Luria's idea about why studying viruses is important is finding those unifying themes between all of the different viruses and, and what does that mean and what can we learn about it. So genomes is clearly a really good way to do that. We've got a pretty good idea how genomes evolve for different viruses and also their hosts. Um, think about the different hosts, you know, the, the host for a particular virus. Since the virus is so dependent on a host, very often you have coevolution that's happening between viruses and hosts. And so having a host associated with a virus is, has been at least in the past, a really good way of thinking about virus classification. But it turns out that there are also some viruses that can hop from host to host. And that makes this much more confusing. One thing that has happened relatively recently, and again, sort of going back to lecture one, all those little tiny dots, the little tiny yellow dots that we had, and you look at seawater, you look at soil samples, all those nucleic acids in the little tiny spots, um, those have very different sequences relative to each other. It's very hard to isolate the host very often, and then the virus that's represented by that particular virion. So one of the ways that people have gone about trying to figure this out is metagenomics. So it's literally collecting all of the nucleic acid in an environment. Usually in this case, we're talking viral metagenomics, all the small particles, sequencing all of their genomes, and then looking at them. And in that process, we found ridiculously large numbers of virus genomes, as I've mentioned before. And then we'll finish up talking a little bit about structures. So the ICTV, um, again, this is the international body which is tasked with classifying viruses. There's now a 10th report, um, all available online, because they also realized that printing massive books, again, with the, the one that I have, which actually is the eighth report, um, as I think about 1,500 pages. Um, it's a really nice book, and I'll bring it down. But uh, people are discovering more and more viruses, and particularly because of this whole explosion in metagenomics, they just can't keep up. And so this is all moved to online. It's where the 10th report is. And the classification here is really about different shared properties. And so what's the nature of the genome? The nature of the genome is getting pretty close to that Baltimore classification. Is it single-stranded DNA? Is it double-stranded DNA? Single-stranded RNA? Single-stranded DNA? Oh, sorry, single-stranded RNA positive strand, single-stranded RNA negative strand, or retroviruses? That's sort of the first kind of classification step. The second one is capsid symmetry. And so you separate viruses based on whether they have icosahedral symmetry or they have helical symmetry, some kind of combination of the two, or in a few cases, those that have none of that symmetry whatsoever, like some of the archaeoviruses, like my favorite one here, um, SSV1, AKA Stanley, the SSV. <clears throat> which has neither helical nor icosahedral symmetry um, to it. Does the virion have an envelope or not have an envelope? 
um, also a way of classifying viruses, and then just how big the capsid happens to be. Now, it, this seemed to be a really good way to classify viruses, but it turns out that there are some examples where you have viruses that can be very closely related to each other that have single-stranded or double-stranded DNA, and some viruses whose virions have envelopes or don't have envelopes but are still the same virion. So some of these things really kind of start to fall apart. The only thing that really seems to work reasonably well is this whole idea of genomes. And so if you have a genome sequence which is similar between two different viruses, then those are highly likely to be related to each other. And so that's really the, the way to go about doing this. Um, and you can assume, and it's a pretty good assumption, that viruses which have similar genomes to each other have descended from a common ancestor. Now, there's certainly possible examples of convergence as well. Um, as of the last release, um, last month, there were 5,561 approved virus species, according to the ICTV, and they have this really ridiculous definition of it here, you know, polythetic class of viruses that constitute a replicating lineage and occupy a particular ecological niche. Okay, so uh, you thought species definitions were bad for animals and plants, they're worse for bacteria and they're even worse for viruses. But at least it gives you some idea of, a, the, the idea of classification is then to try and associate these things together and again in terms of trying to think about how they're all related to each other. It used to be that viruses had species, genera, families, and orders. As of about four months ago, they added class, phylum, kingdom, and realm. I don't know how they define all of these things, um, but <clears throat> just the basic idea here is to show that viruses are incredibly diverse. And if you're going to try and classify them, given a similar kind of classification mechanism as we have for plants, animals, etc., um, you need to give them lots of different ways of thinking about them. And there's a, a nice link here. This is a short, like, one-page article about why virus taxonomy is important. We won't take a look at it now, but if you're interested, you can take a look, uh, closer look at it there. So the ICTV, about 15 years ago now, 14 years, um, came up with this they call the virosphere. And again, I think the only reason I'm using this is so it sort of gives in a nice description of the different classifications that they're using. So in the very middle, it's the different kind of genome they have, double-stranded DNA, single-stranded DNA, single-stranded RNA with reverse transcriptase, positive strand, negative strand, double-stranded RNA, double-stranded DNA with reverse transcriptase, and then the different kinds of virions on the outside of that. And then, unfortunately, it's hard to see here. This is invertebrates and vertebrates out here. Here's bacteria and plants. Uh, then the hosts which they're actually infecting. What I don't like about this is that the pie pieces which are archaea and bacteria are ridiculously small, even though we know that the vast majority of viruses infect bacteria, probably archaea, um, et cetera. So this is how the ICTV thinks about things. Um, and using that is actually really not bad, just sort of a general way of thinking about viruses. If you think about viruses which are packaging DNA, we've got those virions that have single-stranded DNA in them. These are actually some of the smallest genomes. Um, some of them are actually less than 2,000 bases in length, um, so really, really tiny. On the other hand, the double-stranded DNA viruses can be huge, and this is actually out of date. I think they're actually above four megabase pairs in size, some of the largest ones. And so when Nacho showed you that image of the Pandora virus, these are virions you can see in the light microscope, other than having to have an electron microscope. These have really big genomes. In fact, some of these genomes are larger than some of the bacterial genomes. Um, and we'll talk more about some of these giant viruses a little bit later on. Also, these double-stranded DNA viruses are the, probably the most common of the bacteriophage, so the viruses which are infecting bacteria. And yeah, yes, I've only got one bacteriophage up here, but there are way, way more of these than there are of 
any of the other viruses that we know about. Um, Single-stranded DNA viruses actually, interestingly enough, um, infect pretty much all organisms that we've looked at. And the whole concept of single-stranded DNA viruses, you know, so packaging a single-stranded DNA, is a really fascinating one. And we'll, we'll come back and, and talk about this a little bit later when we talk about the, the metagenomics and sort of why single-stranded DNA might be so good. Um, you can kind of have a little bit of a guess here. Um, Nacho said, and I mentioned today, smaller is better. So the smaller amount of the genome you have, maybe that's going to be a really efficient way to be a virus. RNA viruses, again, these are those that are packaging RNA in their virion. You've got positive strand RNA viruses. Some of them can be pretty big, um, 31,000. I think the last one time I checked, I think there may be now one which is 34,000 bases. Now these are bases, they're all single stranded. Um, and single stranded, what did I not like about single stranded for RNA in molecular biology last term? Yeah, they almost always are going to be base pairing. And so the single strand, I like to think more as like single molecule. So, you know, one five prime end and one three prime end. But very often they're in some kind of double stranded. These positive strand RNA viruses, some are the small naked viruses. A lot of plant viruses are positive strand RNA viruses. Um, let's see. This one here is one of those plant viruses, um, single-stranded, positive-strand RNA viruses. Um, some of them are very large um, enveloped viruses, um, really sort of the whole gamut. Most of these are unimolecular. So this gets back to the whole idea of you know, single-stranded versus double-stranded or single-molecule, multi-molecule. The positive-strand RNA viruses almost always have a single molecule, which is their genome. On the other hand, the negative strand RNA viruses, and we'll talk more about those when we talk about these later on in the course, um, they often have segmented genomes. And when I say by segmented genomes, I like to think of this as individual chromosomes. Basically, the virion itself is packaging multiple different pieces. And so each of those is going to have you know, one five prime end, one three prime end. But multiple of those come together. And the, Classic example of this is flu. Um, flu has eight segments of RNA, which are packaged um, inside its virion. Many of these negative strand RNA viruses are the, just a second, um, are the, the nasty viruses. Flu, again, is an example of that. Ebola, um, some of the, the big, bad, nasty um, viruses are often these negative strand RNA viruses. Yeah, Mika. Oh, so the question is, you know, yeah, how, um, is there any correlation between the number of segments and how nasty or pathogenic maybe be another way of thinking about it? Um, there doesn't really seem to be. Um, a lot of these uh, sort of seems to be uh, multiple ways to skin the cat. Um, so you can have one big ginormous genome. Ebola is an example of that. It's just a single molecule, but flu has eight. Um, hantaviruses, sin nombre virus, they have three of why, you know, what's always the answer to why in a biology course? It works or evolution. <laughs> yeah, so um, that seems to be what happens here. Um, Double-stranded RNA viruses, um, these are often segmented genomes. Um, quite why that is, again, evolution. Um, not entirely clear, but most of these have icosahedral capsids. Um, but they're relatively rare, interestingly enough, these, these double-stranded RNA viruses. Yeah. So question is, are segmented genomes all packaged in individual capsids? Um, and the answer to that, as always, is yes and no. <laughs> so um, in some cases, for flu, they're packaged in a single capsid. But in other cases, and there's some plant viruses that hopefully we'll have a chance to talk about later. I'm trying to remember what that is. Um, I think it's tobacco ring spot virus. I'm not absolutely certain. But there are eight segments, which seem to be packaged in eight different virions, and how the heck you can get a productive infection with eight different virions. As a mathematician, you should know how challenging that would be. <laughs> so there's some interesting processes on how you can get, because if they're randomly associated, how you can get them packaged. We'll talk more about that when we talk about the plant viruses a little bit later on. But a you know, great question.
Um, what's left? DNA viruses, RNA viruses, retroviruses, or the reverse transcriptase viruses. Um, these can package RNA or DNA. And so when I talked originally about the Baltimore classifications, I just talked about the ones which are packaging RNA in their virions. But there are also some reverse transcriptase encoding viruses that will package double-stranded DNA in their virions. And the thing which holds all of these together um, is that they're using reverse transcriptase. So they all have a obligate extra reverse transcriptase step that's required. So they take RNA and make it into DNA. And that could either be the RNA being made into DNA in the classic retroviruses. This was what David Baltimore and Howard Temin discovered, which was an RNA that gets copied into the DNA. That DNA gets put into the genome. That DNA then gets transcribed into RNA. The RNA gets put into the capsid. But you can also have DNA, which is present in your virion, that would then get inside the cell, get transcribed into RNA, that RNA would then get reverse transcribed into DNA, and then that DNA would get packaged. So it just really depends on where the packaging takes place in terms of these um, retroviruses. And so there are the classic retroviruses, again, Baltimore and Temin, which package RNA. HEPA DNA viruses, um, these are the hepatitis B-like viruses. Mentioned hepatitis as being an example of disease you can get with many different kinds of viruses. There's a, the, this kind of retrovirus. We also have hepatitis A, which is a <clears throat> positive strand um, RNA virus. Hepatitis C, which is also a positive strand RNA virus, but it's an enveloped virus. Hepatitis D, which is a very, very strange sort of viroid process that we're not going to talk about anymore, but basically four different ways very different viruses that can all cause hepatitis. Um, we're not going to talk any more about this, but it's a partially double-stranded DNA. When I mentioned that you can you know, package inside a virion, you can have DNA or RNA, um, these viruses actually have a small piece of RNA that's associated with the DNA in the virion when it's finally actually packaged. And we can talk more about that if, if people are interested in talking about that a little bit later on. And it turns out there are also some plant viruses that are retroviruses, um, or I say reverse transcriptase encoding viruses, uh, cauliflower mosaic viruses, which also have DNA, but these are packaging just DNA and no RNA, which is associated with it. Then finally, just wanted to mention these. Um, we have not virus viruses or defective viruses. These are viruses which need something else in order to be able to replicate. Um, classic example of the so-called satellite viruses. We'll talk a little bit about these. <clears throat> we talk about the bacterial viruses later on. These are a virus genome that needs some kind of either function or gene from a different virus. Um, and in many cases, it actually turns out it's the capsid protein um, for some of these bacterial viruses. So it needs a helper virus, also adeno-associated virus. These guys here, um, these guys need a co-infection with adenovirus in order to be able to replicate. Um, and it turns out it has to do with the replication machinery. It's not the capsid. These have their own capsid proteins, but they need some of the other machinery of adenovirus in order to be able to replicate. And then there are these things called viroids. Viroids are RNA without capsid. Well, since we kind of defined viruses as having an extracellular state, which has a protein code on it, we can't call these viruses. But they're still infectious. They're infectious RNAs. Um, they can cause disease, actually really quite well known in plants. You'll have plant viroid diseases. How they get transmitted from plant to plant is a really open question that I think nobody completely understands. You know, RNA is supposed to be really unstable, but um, these guys sort of define the case of secondary structures in their RNAs. They're all completely folded up on top of each other, and that whole folding seems to be really important for being able to make them. And this is, um, people like to use this whole idea of a, of a viroid, just RNA by itself can replicate itself, can cause disease, is a remnant of the RNA world. 
I think that's a little bit of a stretch, but nonetheless, I think it's a, an interesting question. So we all ready for clicker questions? Got our clickers out, ready to go? This should be pretty straightforward. If I can get this to actually run now. This is the correct one. <clears throat> so, pardon? Delay. Yes, delay. Which of the following Baltimore classes of viruses have the largest genomes? Double-stranded DNA viruses, class one. Single-stranded DNA viruses, class two. Single-stranded RNA viruses, positive strand, class four. Single-stranded RNA viruses, negative strand, class five. Reverse strand superdivided viruses, class six. And as usual, as I <clears throat> did for molecular biology, um, if we're more than 75 percent, 80 percent in the first round, we'll stop. If we're less than that, then we'll <clears throat> have a discussion round beforehand. Um, uh, AA. Default frequency, yeah. Five. Okay, oh, let's uh, display our results. Yes, it's the double-stranded DNA viruses. Um, I will try, I think most people, it looked like a lot of people had registered at the D2L site, but I'm not sure if that registration went through. I may need to tweak. Have people found the link on D2L to register their, their clickers? Okay, I'm gonna have to keep checking on that. I got the list of everybody and the list of their clickers, but they weren't associated with each other. So I'll, I'll keep working on that, trying to figure it out. So yes, A is the, the correct answer. Yeah, and I want to switch gears a little bit and talk about metagenomics. <clears throat> this again is the case of where you go into a particular environment, you collect all of the nucleic acid and then sequence it. In terms of virus metagenomics, what you do is you get all of the small particles, you get rid of the bacteria, you get rid of the archaea and eukaryotes, and then you just sequence. And just over the last couple of years, um, people have done a lot of this. And what they found is literally thousands of new genomes. 125,000 in 2016. This was a study just looking at marine samples. Um, there's a new software program. And this was just look literally looking in the databases. Already published, already sequenced. They found almost 13,000 new virus genomes, and these are provirus genomes. These are genomes that are sitting in these host genomes, ready to come back out. And then <clears throat> in terms of vertebrate RNA viruses, and we'll look at this example a little bit later on, and of course vertebrates and RNA viruses is really constraining a lot what kinds of viruses you can find. There are already about 250 new virus genomes here. I was, um, Till last year, I always used to complain that the ICTV wasn't wild about metagenomes, um, but it turns out that they've changed their minds, and there's a new discussion about um, why metagenomes are actually okay, and you can actually now define a new virus species just based on a sequence. You don't actually have to have a virion, you don't have to have a host. You can just define a new virus species based on sequence. Um, and why is this so important? Um, that's because the vast majority of viruses, we don't know what they infect. We don't have anything other than their genome. So each of these gray dots up here represents a virus population, as they call it. And these are now any of the gray ones. Um, we have no idea what they infect. And some of these are present in almost 40% of samples that people find, and this is an ocean um, study, this is the Tara Ocean study where you know, poor people they had to sail around the world and collect samples as they went, uh, then analyzed all of them uh, really nicely. And um, from of these, again, about 15,500 of them are known in terms of what they infect. But these most prevalent ones, except for this guy right here, which infecting some of the rhodobacter, which are some of the common marine microbes. Um, the vast majority of these really common ones, we have no idea what they're infecting. So there's a lot of work to do there, which is great for all of you. 
um, and to some extent for me as well. But <clears throat> um, this is, again, this, is, these are, in fact, this was all, I think, double-stranded DNA virus genomes, if I remember correctly. Um, in this same paper, which is a really nice one, and I think I'll, um, I think I have it linked on D2L. If not, um, I'll make sure that it's there. Um, here's the, the DOI and link to it as well. Um, if you just look now at single-stranded DNA viruses, not the double-stranded DNA viruses, but single-stranded DNA viruses, um, and this is present in lots of different, basically all of the single-stranded DNA viruses that people have found in searching through genomes, and then try and compare all of them to each other, um, and with that come up with these phylogenetic trees. Um, each of the tips here represents one kind of virus, potentially a new species of virus, and the known ones are these colored ones right here. So just in going out in environments, you see that of you know, 659 relative to 10, again, so 640, almost 650, are new branches of these single-stranded DNA viruses. So uh, ridiculous amounts of diversity most of which we really have no idea about. We're actually working on some of these um, viruses. I forget which of these clades represents the Cruci viruses, um, which we'll hear more about um, later on in the term when, when George Kaysen comes and talks, and this is also what Nacho is working on when he's in the lab. I mentioned the new vertebrate RNA viruses. Um, this is a study by Eddie Holmes and his group, Australia and China. Uh, they said, you know, the vast majority of viruses that people have looked at so far have been viruses which are infecting mammals, but if you now look through many more genomes, and a lot of this was just literally going to RNA sequences that they could find from as diverse vertebrates as they could find, and just sequencing all the RNA. Of course, they didn't sequence the RNA, they sequenced the cDNA, and in that process they found all of these sequences which matched known viruses, let alone a bunch of sequences that match nothing. So just in sequences that matched known viruses, they had, I think it was about almost 300 new species of RNA viruses, many of which were associated with already known virus families, but all of these brown ones are clearly new ones. And not surprisingly, as soon as you get away from mammals, which have about 1,300 species that were already known, um, reptiles, amphibians, ray fin fish, jawless fish, many, many, many new viruses. So basically, as soon as you go and find a new organism, you'll find new viruses that are associated with it. Whether this some of these new viruses, some of them, Bornaviridae, Filoviridae, Filoviridae are actually those viruses that are in the same class as Ebola virus and Marburg virus. Are these potentially viruses which could then go from that animal host and then jump into humans? Distinct possibility, and in fact, one of the things that Eddie Holmes is doing is doing a lot of these surveys to try and discover some of these viruses in their natural hosts before they end up in human hosts. And in fact, a lot of those um, nasty diseases, Mika, you're asking about um, the you know, multiple forms of their genomes. The main thing about the nasty diseases in humans is usually they're perfectly happy and have been co-evolving with their regular host, but it's when they get into humans and it's a big problem. And that may even be the case with flu. Flu is mostly circulating in birds where they don't seem to get very sick, but as soon as it gets into humans, then it can be a real problem. So um, a lot of this surveying is, yeah, it's really cool because you're finding new viruses, but there's also a potential um, human health aspect um, to go with them as well. And one of Eddie Holmes' talks actually kind of based on this study. Um, he has, I think, this really nice graphic of the, the known human viruses, you know, 219 of them, known classified viruses, is a little older, you know, 4,404 classified viruses, and then everything else. So there's still a lot to discover as far as new sequences. So this is, a, I think, is a really cool study. Again, um, was published just last year. Um, a bunch of new viruses. I think this was in Nature. I forget. I should give you the, the link as well. Put it in um, references in D2L. 
But this is all new viruses that people knew about. And they have a sequence that they compare things to. What about sequences that you can't compare them to? Or if you have a new sequence, can you assign it to any one of these different virus families or not? So that brings us to thinking about some of the really deep branching viruses and some of the information about <clears throat> how we can think about how viruses are related to each other that has nothing to do with genome sequence and not finding a sequence similarity in order to think about it. And that brings us to my second favorite virus, first favorite virus, depends on your point of view. Um, STIV, um, to have a little story about this, um, we were looking for viruses like this in samples from Yellowstone National Park. And I'll say it was a late night at the microscope. I actually don't remember what time of day it was. Um, I was sitting at the electron microscope and I was looking for things like this. And I saw something like this. And one of my immediate thoughts was, I'm probably the first person in the world to ever see this, which was pretty darn amazing. Uh, now, that being said, I'm, I saw these you know, projections on the outside. It was a clearly icosahedrally symmetric virus. We never found any kind of icosahedrally symmetric virus in any of these hot spring environments before. Um, and as soon as I saw this, I went and told Mark Young, who was the, my postdoctoral advisor at the time, and he said, well, we've got to send this to our buddies at Scripps. Um, and our buddies at Scripps are um, Jack Johnson, uh, who is one of the leading virus structural biologists, really, in the world. Um, and they got really excited about it, and they did the structure. We got this, you know, T equals 30, 31 new form of symmetry, icosahedral symmetry. But what they noticed um, that I had no clue about at the time, and they got really excited about, is not so much these really neat projections of the five-fold axis of symmetry, and there's a T equals 31 virus particle. What they saw was that the major capsid proteins that fit into this structure were actually really similar at the protein structural level to a virus that infected bacteria, PRD1, and also to a virus that infected humans, adenovirus. And to make a bit of a long story short, here are the examples of these different virus structures. So, Wonderful things about 3D printers. Um, Nacho mentioned last time the jelly roll. And so beta sheets sort of wrapped around each other, alternating beta sheets. This is a double jelly roll. Um, jelly roll here, jelly roll here. And that was exactly the structure that was found for this bacterial virus and the eukaryotic virus. This was a virus which is infecting archaea. So we've got sequences, sorry, not sequences, structures that basically perfectly match each other, even though they're infecting hosts from completely different domains of life. Um, and the best way to look at that is actually when you start to look at them as trimers. You know, I've got these models up here, hard to see in the back, but these are the structures from the bacterial virus and from the archaeal virus that are basically identical to each other. But there's no sequence similarity between them. No detectable sequence similarity between these protein sequences. So what does this mean? Um, could be horizontal gene transfer. Um, definite possibility. Um, we think that's unlikely. Convergent evolution. Definite possibility. As I mentioned right at the beginning, we've got these iconsohedrally symmetric particles. That's going to be like a sphere. So it's a geometric constraint. Certainly a possibility, but we know that there are other ways that you can make these icosahedrally symmetric particles. We like to think, as an example, that these viruses are descended from a common ancestor of these different viruses. So we tried to publish this in Science and Nature, and they didn't like it. Um, so we ended up publishing in PNAS. And then um, one of the commentators on that, a fellow by the name of Roger Hendricks, um, compared us to, to Darwin. And I was like, oh, anytime you get compared to Darwin in the scientific literature, you basically made it as a biologist. Um, so <clears throat> that was published a little while ago. And then um, the structure um, of the coat protein of STIV is the, <clears throat> I 
guess what's the right color here, um, sort of turquoise one over here on the left. So another way of thinking about this is that <clears throat> we had a, we have these three different virus structures, the virion structures I say, bacteria, infecting bacteria, archaea, and eukarya. Um, the overall structures of virions look quite different. It's PRD1, here's STIV, and here's adenovirus. But in terms of the structure of the major capsid protein, they're practically identical to each other. So we think the most parsimonious argument is that there was a virus particle probably infecting some kind of common ancestor way back here billions of years ago. So we're not the only people who think this. Um, there's a group in Finland um, led by Dennis Bamford who also has shown this, and not just for adenovirus, STIV, and PRD1, but also from other bacterial viruses. There's an algal virus. There's even a virus which infects giant viruses, kind of a satellite virus. All of these seem to converge on this double jelly roll protein as sort of being the ancestor of all of these other kinds of proteins, which fit together um, to make these, these icosahedral capsids. So I like to think that I had a little tiny part of, of this process in thinking about um, some of these. And these are, again, very different virus families, adenoviruses that infect vertebrates, PM2 is bacteria, alga, vertebrates, archaea, bacteria, and then some which <clears throat> are also infecting viruses as well. So why don't we finish up with our last clicker question for today. Which of the following is thought to be the best way to assign taxonomy to the deepest branching virus groups? Baltimore class, captive protein structure, metagenomic analysis, sequence phylogeny. One's voting E. Why not? We um, clearly have some differences of opinion here, so why don't we take a minute and discuss what we decided and why. So, talk to your neighbors. Tell them what you decided and why you decided it. We should force Greg to get a clicker. Ready to go again? Yeah, you, yeah, you, yeah, no, yeah. You can keep chatting. <laughs> yeah, you can feel free to continue to discuss. The last click is the one that counts. That there's not an obvious consensus probably means it's not a very good question.
Yeah, there were 22 who voted last time. Did people leave already? 10. Eight, yeah, that's how long the file of the knife branches are. And want to re-change their vote? Did I just answer that question? Oh, the question was deepest branch is, you know, how far away they are from each other phylogenetically. So deepest branching. Okay. That makes sense? That that answer your question? Okay. <laughs> we'll see, we'll see, we'll see what the answer is. <laughs> Okay, so what do people think? Um, very divided opinion. Um, capsid protein structure, metagenomic analysis, sequence phylogeny. Um, assign taxonomy the deepest branching groups. If you have deep branch, what does that mean? Very distantly related to each other. The most extremely distantly related to each other. What are you gonna see? What kind's gonna be conserved? Structure is probably likely to be conserved, whereas the sequences are less likely to be. So that's how people are thinking about the very deepest and probably should have very deepest branching groups. So I like B. Um, so with that, um, if people would like to come up and check out the structures up here, particularly our younger students, um, please come and check these guys out. Um, we'll see you on Wednesday.